Good evening again, my friends. Good evening. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for what? They shall see God. And so as David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Amen. May the Lord further that cleansing work in our lives. A couple things coming up that we want you to be especially aware of in this busy season. Busy is a blessing. It's better than bored. Amen. Praise God. I pray we're using our time and our talents wisely. Our ladies are headed off this weekend, so be in prayer for them that they would go up on the mountain of God, amen, and come down with their faces aglow, amen. God bless you ladies that are going. Our men's one-day conference is coming up in May. It's May 16th, and we'd like you to sign up so we can coordinate rides and just make sure that we're in fellowship together as we join with other Calvary Chapel churches. It's going to be a sweet day. Set apart to seek the Lord. Make sure you're a part of that. It's here in Sacramento, so it just doesn't get any better than that. Amen. And then this Sunday, I'm so very excited to, as we announced last Sunday, for Pastor George to take us through a three-week study on the Holy Spirit. And so bring a friend with you. It's going to be an exciting time just to see what the Lord will do and to make this an annual thing. Excited and blessed to have Pastor George here to do that. And so for the next three Sundays, sorry ladies, you'll have to get the CD or listen on our website. We have a new app which is coming out probably two weeks. And it'll be ready, back up and running. We're very excited about that. Until then, you can listen on the website or grab a CD. Uh, but that's going to be a sweet series. Uh, excited to have Pastor Gerard share with us tonight from the Word. Isaiah, I hear. Why don't you welcome him up? God bless, guys. Good evening, everybody. Ooh, you could hear my breathing. Well, I guess uh, we won't have any, uh, any PowerPoint tonight. So I will be reading the text first. Uh, before we go into the study. A few weeks back, I was, uh, um, I was wondering, thinking about like all of these things that we do for the Lord. And I was, I was saying, Lord, I hope that of all of the things that I have done for you, something will come back unburned. We know that like sometimes when we've, we've been talking about in our studies of how Sometimes when we offer something to the Lord, it's not always with the most holy of motives or intentions. And that's why it's kind of scary to, to realize that not all of our crowns will be there. So, but then we also realize that it also takes much more than just, than just an offering. And we will look, at, we'll, we will look tonight at the, at, the, at the first chapter of Isaiah. And we will see what the Lord had to say to the, his people when, was, as they tried to offer uh, unto him uh, sacrifices. So um, I will be reading from Isaiah chapter 1. Shall we all rise for the reading of God's word? Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, king, kings of Judah, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors, that they have forsaken the Lord, that they have provoked, that they have, 
that they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it, and it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in the vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been made like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. Do not delight in the blood of bulls or, or of lambs or, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is, a, is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do, to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For, from the, mouth, for, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's all be seated. But what does it really mean to be able to lift up worship that is acceptable to God? Because the thing is, every week, every Sunday at least, or every time that we come together, that this is a hope that we can offer God something that will make Him uh, have pleasure, that our offering will be acceptable in His sight. It turns out for the people of Israel, it, it wasn't always like that. And there was a certain requirement for all that they had offered God. So let's start out with with the first verse, which is the setup of the whole of our text tonight, uh, which I entitled Worship and Holiness, a discourse from the first chapter of Isaiah. So in the first verse, it says here, a vision, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem um, in, in the days of uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, Isaiah was one of the more the most evangelistic of all the prophets in the Old Testament. While he, while he served uh, God under the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah, pretty much it was the same, the same calling that he had. Uh, while he was describing the need for repentance in the nation of Israel, it was always because of a warning that there was going to be coming, a coming judgment. And many, time, many times in his, in, his, uh, in his book, he keeps repeating but there is always a hope. Why? Because there is a coming Savior. But in, in the meantime, in the meantime, they had to look for the, the kind of life that, that God was making out in, in, in their midst. So you see here that um, many times the, the, um, the prophet Isaiah will speak of, of someone like the, like the coming Jesus, the coming, the coming Lord. And in the, in the first verses here, we will see that it's, it was really about how how Israel had somehow been corrupted, uh, not only through 
their own idolatries, but also through the surrounding uh, nations' uh, corruptions. So um, you will see here also that this was pretty much concerning the people of, Ju of Judah and Jerusalem. So it was a pretty much uh, the whole Israeli nation that they were uh, they had already had turned away from God. Now you might ask, in the midst of all of this, while while um, while the prophet Isaiah was sharing all of this, they had been going through the the normal uh, offerings, the normal worship of, of, of the Jews at that time. But the God, had, uh, the God had to take a special uh, option, um, was saying that none of it was really acceptable. Um, in the second verse, it says here, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, o, o earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. It's almost like God was presenting the heaven, in the heavenly courts what had happened to this, the, this, his creation. For he has spoken that I have nourished, meaning to say that he has provided for, for the physical needs of his people. And he has brought them up, he has raised them up. And yet they have rebelled against him. What does rebellion mean, basically? Basically, rebellion is, uh, is the going to go against um, an authority. And it was not a matter of whether they understood him or not. But it was because of a, a willful uh, decision to go against the, the, the desires of God. Apparently, yes, he, at this point, he was pretty much uh, trying to witness or to show the pain of an estranged parent. Like, even as he had cared for Israel, he was now pointing out the need for, for them to go, come back to him. Now, Isaiah was sharing this in that, that he might somehow convince them to realize also that there was a coming, um, a coming day of reckoning, which was when, when there, were, there was going to be uh, an invasion of, of, of other evil nations against them. But in the third verse, the Lord says, the ox knows, or uh, the, uh, the prophet Isaiah says, the ox knows its owner and the donkey his master's crib. Now, even in these times, in our times, when you look at an ox, Pretty much, even a, even a person when he's described as an ox is someone who doesn't is not so intelligent. Okay, someone who who doesn't know very much. And the donkey is known for what? A donkey is known for being stubborn. Okay, so firstly, the ox doesn't know anything. Really, doesn't know anything. And then the donkey is stubborn. It's pretty much like in the first uh, chapter of Romans when God faults the people not for not for if I may use the word, not for stupidity, but foolishness, that there's a difference. It's never about stupidity. And whenever people turn away from God, it's not because they could not understand him or because they, or because they did not have any information about him, but it was always because of a willful, will, willful turning away from what God wanted. In the first chapter of Romans, you would see that they're described as a people who are a law to themselves. And basically, that is, what, that is why people would not um, acknowledge God. That's why, that's why they are atheists. But in this particular case, uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah uses the, the visual of, of the, having the stupidity of an ox and the stubbornness of a donkey. So the, he was saying that, oh, even the, even the ox who, su is supposedly, who supposedly does not know anything, it will acknowledge its owner. It will recognize its owner. Oh, and the donkey, he knows where to go home. He knows his master's crib, but Israel, they don't know him. They, uh, they, they do not know, and he says, my people do not consider. When he says that, it means that they have no knowledge of, of God and or what he really is doing for them, and also that they, are not will, that they are not actually thinking out the consequences of what they do. They're stubborn, they're, they're hard-headed, okay? So here, uh, all of creation is really called to witness the indictment of God's children, even as they acted out, acted out the evil stuff that they were doing. Uh, they were likened to dumb and stubborn animals. So uh, despite this, none of them would consider him. And in verse 4, he says, Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have, they are, they have forsaken the Lord, and they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned uh, away back, backward. Um, 
when people go get on their evil way or when they go their evil way, this is the consequential transformation that, uh, of what happens to them. When you relate with God, somehow he, His holiness will rub off on you. And last, su- last Sunday, Pastor was even talking about the people who are closest to God, who spend time with God, they somehow are transformed into a greater likeness of Him. The sad truth is, the opposite is also true. When people do not acknowledge God, and they move away from, from Him, and they want to live their lives as they want to do it, they, are also, they, they also, by themselves, become worse and worse in, in terms of their morality. There's a saying, show me who your friends are, and you don't know that saying? When you say, show me who your friends are, show me who you are, right? You pretty much become like the people you associate with. So when you associate with God, it's natural that even as believers, there are believers who quickly become more and more like God because they spend the time with God. But then there are, there are also non-believers who not only do not know God, but they do everything that they can to stay away from Him. And you will see even later in our study of how that affects them. So pretty much our, our morality is often based on how we relate to God. You can see from, from the fourth verse how, they, how they're being described. First, they, uh, he says that they are a sinful nation or a, a nation that has pretty much misunderstood and missed the mark about who God is. And they are laden with evil or iniquity. They are a brood of evildoers. What they do together, or they are corporately against what God has. And also, even the children who are supposed to be innocent are what? They are corruptors. Right? That's why most parents would say, oh, don't go with this bad crowd because you're going to be influenced. So even in those days, uh, Isaiah was already recognizing that even the children were already tainted. They were already corrupted, and therefore they in turn were corruptors of other children. They have forsaken the Lord, or they have uh, turned away from Him. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. Pretty much it was a willful uh, decision to turn away from God. In verse 5, he says, so why should you be stricken again? Right? So what is the consequence why, why, they should, why they need to be chastised? Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. And this is what happens is when you turn away from God, you start the, the, your understanding of God starts to dim. You come up with your own perception, not only your own perception, but also your understanding of him. And you start coming up with, with ideas that, that, that somehow belittle God in your own thinking. And this is what happens. Your whole head is sick, and therefore, as a consequence also, your heart, your heart faints. The premise is this, that, we, that God had made us to be who we are, to be with him, right? But then when the hope of becoming who we need to be is gone, then we, there's no reason for us to be. And therefore, our whole heart loses sight of what we need to be. From verse 6, it says, From the sole of the foot to the head, there is no soundness in it, but the wounds and bruises putrefy- and putrefying sores, they have not been closed nor bound up or soothed with ointment. You see here, they have, they have tried everything to fix the situation. And in the, physically, they were showing the spiritual reality that they were not getting any better. Okay? Uh, in, in, the sense, in this sense, they were physically, they were physically sick or ill, uh, but it was really a reflection of, of their spirituality. It says here, from the sole of the foot even to the head. So the whole body from, from, the, from the feet to the head is already uh, corrupted. And there is no soundness in it. I don't know what it's like to have a, a failing disease or a crippling disease. But many a time you, you, you will know and even acknowledge that when you cannot move or you have no ability to, to do what you want with your body, well, I'm getting an, more and more of an idea, idea of it even as I get older. When the things that you used to do, you can't do anymore, right? So, so even, even as this, the, the prophet Isaiah was saying, well, there's something wrong in the whole nation and even in, in your physic- physicality. And it's actually made, made manifest by, by your wounds that wouldn't heal. When you say putrefying source, can you visualize that? When, when, when your skin breaks and there's no ointment that will fix it, 
and there's always something like something wrong in your body and you couldn't do what you want to do. So the idea here is they have constantly been trying to, to heal it with, with ointment and yet it would not close up or it would not bind up. Meaning that whatever the problem is, it's really internal. It's not just the physical, the outside. Uh, it's not on the skin, basically. Right? There was a time that I, I got ill with something that was from inside and boils kept, kept coming out of my body. And firstly, the doctors were saying, oh, let's, let's try to put ointment. And they found out it was actually a blood disorder because my blood was dirty. And in the same way, there's a spiritual analogy to that. That sometimes when, when, you're, when you're, your relationship with God is not right, then somehow it will come out in the way that you relate with him and with other people. And that's also as a matter of consequence. In verse 7, it says here, your country is desolate, your city is burned with fire. Now, now uh, Isaiah uses the illustration of, of their actual cities, of how God has this, uh, pulled back his favor on them, and therefore, as a consequence, the cities were all desolate. And then he says, strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Many a time in the history of Israel, it's, almost, it's never because of, of God not being able to defeat who their enemies are. The only times that, that other nations are able to defeat them is because when God was allowing it, because of their own sin. It was never because, it was never because God was, was saying, oh, I couldn't beat them. But rather, God was actually using other nations to chastise his own people. Verse 8, so the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard and as a hut in a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. As in like everything has become, as a matter of course of, of all of the invasions that had happened to Israel, nobody can really build houses. They kept living in booths or, or tents basically or in, in uh, makeshift dwellings, right? Um, I don't know if you have any idea of what it is like to be constantly unsettled. And, and they say that this is pretty much what it is like to have no home. When there's no, when nothing, nothing is permanent, it, everything is temporary, at any moment's notice you, could, you, you would have to move or anything like that. Like people in a war-torn country or the homeless who keep moving from place to place wherever they can get food, right? So you understand that this is all a consequence of their sin. Even so, you can see that uh, as a matter of course, in 2 Kings, you will see that Israel was attacked by, by Sennacherib. 46 of its towns and surrounding villages, 200,000 men were taken prisoners. And all that was left were, were inconsequential outhouses. Sennacherib attacked, attacked Israel, right? and, and uh, just, just messed up everything. And they had, the, and they had the, the goal to actually leave only outhouses. So everything that Israel had was just gone. And all of its men, take, it's 200,000 200, of its men taken prisoners. So this is the consequences of their sin. Now in verse nine, we will see something interesting about uh, the sin. It says, it says in verse 9, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been made like Gomorrah. Now mind you, when it says unless the Lord of hosts had left to us, it's like the, the, the retention of that small remnant was not really because they were good or better than the rest. It was, it was not really because they were more holy than the others but it was because of the grace of God that was available to them. He says, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a, sm a very small remnant. How small? Very small. Okay? And when you say remnant, what, the, what, I, what, does, what visual does that give you? It's a much smaller group of people. What was left, basically? So which means majority of Israel had gone the way uh, of the enemy. And instead, and instead, it was only a small group of, of people who remained faithful to God. And had it not been for the Lord, they would have, they would have become like Sodom, and, and we, would have become, we would have become like Sodom, 
and we would have been like made like Gomorrah, and we all know how they how, how those cities ended. Okay. The thing is, uh, it, God, uh, the 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 prophet Isaiah was likening the people of God to people who were in Sodom, to people who were in Gomorrah, which means they were doing the same things that the people there had been had been doing. Sodomy, Gomorrahi, are symptoms and expressions of man's discon discontent and dis dissatisfaction. It's almost like God had given them the blueprint of how to live their lives, and yet they said, well, we don't want to follow what you, what you provide or what you're telling us to do. We want to do it a different way. And because of that, they were never satisfied, and they never found what it was like to be fulfilled by their obedience. They were, they were constantly looking for an answer to their dissatisfaction because they would not follow God. Oh God, I know better than you. Let me do it my way. And they never found out what it is like to be fulfilled. They are man's attempts at fulfillment apart from God. But the, but the sad part is that they will never be fulfilled until we live out lives that were intended for us at creation. He says here, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of God you people of Gomorrah. Apparently from verse 10, we can see that God had spoken to the rulers of Sodom and yet they would not listen to it, right? They would not, they would not give, it, give him time of day. And they thought them, somehow thought themselves having better uh, alternatives to what God was providing for them. Also, the people themselves, I don't know if it was because of the, their rulership, they also were apathetic to what God had to say. He says, uh, He's, they would not give ear to the law of our God. They would not listen to what he had to say. Okay? So pretty much like, like rulers, like people, it was a reflection of who they really were, of how they were in their hearts. So it was the willful rejection of the leaders and apathy from the people. So they, in, in this particular case, they were being likened to Sodom and Gomorrah. That despite the many, the many efforts at, at saving them, they insisted on what they had to do, and therefore, the final judgment had to come. So, because of this, from verses 11 to 15, we will look at the useless worship, which, which comes to, like, even as, as, as we lift up worship to God, it says here in verse 11, To what purpose is the multitude of, our sacrifice, is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. But wait a minute, wasn't these the things that he told them to offer him? So, but, but now he was saying that he was not pleased with them. Well, as we look at the situation, we come to understand that it was not really the offering, but the life behind it. We, that we need to understand. If, if we take anything from this study, it is that. Now, whatever we offer to God, it's not really the two mites of, of, the, of, the, of the poor woman, right? Or, or your millions that you just pulled from your pocket. Why? Because it, God is really thinking or looking at the cost of what it cost you. There's a difference between cost and valuation, right? If, if there is something that's easy for you to get and you just said, oh, here, God, here's just like, you know, my leftovers, I have a billion more in my pocket, but I just, I'm giving you a million. But to, the, to God, God is not really impressed with, with what we can give. But somehow he is, uh, he is, he is, he is uh, insulted by what we don't. This we need to understand. There's a difference between cost and valuation. Um, as you can see from the, from the verse, he said, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and and, and the fat of fed cattle. These were like supposedly the, the very best that, that Israel could offer. And he, in fact, uh, specified them. But he says, I do not delight in the blood of bulls, which you should, is, that's for the sin offerings, right? He says, I do not delight in them or, of, or, the la or lambs or, or goats. And then he says, when you come to appear uh, before me, verse 12, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? He was saying, I didn't ask you for this. 
this is not the, the, the offerings that I have that I desire from you. So whenever we, whenever we come before God, we, we need to wonder with whatever we're offering him, what it really cost us. Because everything or anything and everything that we offer him will be unacceptable if it is what? If it did not cost us or if it is unholy. Because some of us, uh, admittedly, some, some people, they, they say, uh, God, I went to church this Sunday, right? So, one down, okay. Oh, Lord, I also went to Wednesday night. Right? And when I, when I got there, I just, you know, I, I, shared, I shared and had to listen to that boring preacher, 10 points. But here's the thing, though. None of that, if it is unholy, is acceptable before God. So which, which means we all go through, and when I say all, I mean all. We all go through the motions of, of offering something to God. But the, question, the constant question has to be, is he actually pleased with what I'm doing? Because the truth is, it's not going to matter. When we get to heaven, it's going to be one of those crowns that get burned. Right? So how would you like to live the rest of your lives, um, what do you call it? saving up all those crowns that will only get burned later as opposed to heeding the lord's call right now and finally being able to realize that what he wants is an offering that is holy one that is worthy of him in verse 13 he says bring me no more futile sacrifices so he calls the sacrifices what futile or worthless right Futile sacrifices. And then he says, incense is an abomination to me. Because oh, like they, they lift up offerings and they burn stuff and then supposedly the smell of it is pleasing to God. Okay, And then the new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. And they are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. What does that mean? Like we go through all the motions of ministry and, and, and worship here, but if there are things that are not right in our lives, God is not pleased with it. Kind of a, a, a big thing to, to, it's a shocker, huh? So it, it's like if I go to church, you know, like willy-nilly, and then I say, okay, Lord, I'm going to go through the hour and a half and just go home. What really happened? Did we really get close to God? Now, what does it really look like? It says in verse 15, When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers, and I will not hear. So he says, uh, your hands are full of blood. So we say, so when you spread out your hands in worship, right? What is God going to do? If our hands are full of blood, then he's going to hide his eyes or he will not look at us or even uh, he says even though you make many prayers I will not hear so the repetition and, and, the, and the quality of our prayers are not really heard if there is not a holy life behind it but instead we need to come and reason together what does, what does God need or what, what makes our worship acceptable to him he says in verse 16 wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. While he was talking to all of Israel, doesn't this sound like individual to you? It sounds like he's talking to every person. He says, watch yourselves and make yourselves clean or, or confess your sins and repent. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Because basically, when you, whenever we do evil things, it is just the manifestation, as we have seen er in the earlier text, it's really the, a, man, a manifestation of our estrangement from God. Remember we said like the closer you get to God, the more holy you become. And so whenever we're, we're far from God and we don't meet with him or we don't spend any time with him, maybe somehow, especially if we're immersed in, in, the, in the mechanics of religion and ritual, we somehow can, we can set aside all of the unholy things that, that are true in our lives. 
But he says here, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. So we need to realize that really the things that we do are really an expression or the manifestation of our estrangement from God. In verse 17, he says, Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, and plead for the widow. Now what does it mean to learn to do good? Why did he have to say, to, to tell them, learn to do good? Now I looked up the definition of the word to learn or the verb to learn. It says to gain knowledge of or the skill to or skill in through study instruction and experience which tells me even as a people of god this was not happening in their midst they were going through all the motions of worship you know bringing all the the offerings and go, you know going through all all the motions of their religion and yet they had not really learned or practiced or were instructed in doing good or in in being righteous you can see here it says seek justice what does it mean to seek which means to search or obtain or discover or to finally reach equity or justice amongst people we need to rebuke the oppressor what does that mean to speak out against evil that happens to defend the fatherless to provide covering to the children who what who don't have parents to take care of them and also to plead for the widow to make intercession for the needs of women who have lost their husbands, also their covering, which is basically to do the work of God. Now, when you look at this and you say, well, for me to do this, it means having to live my life for other people. See, because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't talk about you bettering yourself it doesn't talk about you achieving as much as possible in this earth or you know, be making something or spending time uh, practicing how to play the guitar so that when I come to church, I can wow you all. Well, that's not possible. Or practice preaching so I can wow you all. But that's not what God is asking for. He says, no, no, no. Before you do all, go through all the mechanics of, all, of what you want to give me, there's an issue. You need to learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Live for others. Bless them for I love them or, or somehow serve them. Okay? So here's the thing. You look at these things and they're supposed to, supposed to be self-explanatory to do these things. And this is what the, the picture of a worthy worshiper is. It's not really about the kneeling and the standing and the, and the, you know, kumbaya, Lord, and all that. Behind that is the more important thing, is to being able to live not only a holy, but also a righteous life that is lived for others. The Lord of the Sabbath watches what we do every day. That is a realization that, like, struck me on the head. It's like, oh, whatever I offer God on Sunday has to be born of what I did the whole week. Because if I was not doing verse 17, what of, what of what I offer God will be acceptable on Sunday, on Sabbath? Nothing will. Do you understand that? So there is a sense to which the way I live my life from, from, from Monday to Saturday will affect how I, or what I offer to God on Sunday. Do we need a savior? You bet I do. Okay? So we need to live a life of service to others, pursuing righteousness, not only in the personal life, but in your social circles. And looking at verse 16 suggests to me that, like I said, it's not about the, expecting the government to do these things, because these are like for other people, right? Oh, we expect, oh, let the government do it. But it's really about in God talking to individuals, to individual Jews, and saying, and saying yourselves, right? Do it yourselves. So this is what a, a real worshiper looks like. He serves others during the week. And when he comes on Sunday, whatever he offers, offers to God becomes acceptable. But he cannot be holy. So in verse 18, he says, 
Come now and let us reason together. For those who, for those who sin, this is what he, he says. Come now and let us reason together. Let us come and sit together. If there's, if there's anything wrong between us, he says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they are wool. What is the color of, what is the red or the crimson signifying? signifying? It is the color of, of blood. Okay? So it said in, for the wages of sin is death. And even in the, in, in the Old Testament, really the idea of, of, of uh, them sac- giving, sacrificing bulls and goats is really uh, to show that the shedding of blood as a matter of course, as a, as a, not as a payment, but as an offering to cover the sin. Actually, these are types for the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is something that we need to realize. So we, need, we come to the idea of the color of blood. And therefore, the only way that that, that, that blood can be turned away is through, is through uh, reasoning together with the Lord and seeking forgiveness, even as the Lord Jesus Christ has died for us on the cross. Then again, in verses eight, 19 and 20, there is a consequence here. Verse 19 is conditional. It says, if you are willing and obedient, right? Uh, If there's a willingness, there's an understanding of the necessity of good. And then as a reward, you um, you shall eat the good of the land. When you are willing, you're obedient and therefore following God as opposed to self-choice. When you say obedient, it's almost like you had other things to do or you wanted to do one, one thing and God said, Oh, this is the way you need to do it. Well, then, obedient is actually following the way that he wants you to do it. Disobedient is not doing it the way he wants. It's simple, right? And yet, somehow, in the life of Israel and of the individual Jew, somehow they constantly say, oh, my way is better and I'll do what I want. In verse 20, he says, but if you refuse and, and rebel, another conditional, right? You shall be devoured by the sword, which means there's a coming... Uh, judgment through other nations as they will come upon Israel. He says, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken and the tense there is, is past and therefore the edict has been given as the Lord has provided that whenever there is sin, there has, there has to come a judgment and, a, and a, what do you call it, a day of reckoning for whatever evil that there is. Now you will see how this all, all comes into what it really means for us to be able to, to lift up worship that is acceptable in the sight of God. We need to un- understand and realize that we were created to have fellowship and relationship with God. And whenever we live in disobedience or we stay away from Him and estranged from Him, then we could, that we could not even ever hope to be, to, to be pleasing to Him when our sense of, of being is actually wrapped in why we were created, which was, again, to, to have fellowship and a relationship with God. You remember Jerry Maguire when he said, you complete me? <laughs> I don't think he has any idea what it means for any believer to say to God, you complete me. Because without God, none of us, and I mean none of us, can ever be fulfilled. We are, we were all, we are all broken if we don't have God. And therefore, religion and ritual could never take the place of a real relationship with God. Because sometimes this is what people do. If I I go into religion and ritual, somehow I don't have to face the reality of my broken relationship with God. And people do it all the time. There are times that I've done it. You you try to be busy and not have to, 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 um, to deal with who you really are when other people are not looking. But then what does it really mean to worship in spirit and in truth? You remember how the Lord Jesus said to the woman, um, call your husband, right? Call your husband. And there's a reality that this woman needed, needed something and she was trying to f- fulfill it with husbands. And therefore, whenever we come to God without being who, bringing who we really are, somehow covering up how, how Monday to Saturday was lived, 
then there is really a turning away from God, what God really wants from us. And therefore, none of what we offer is acceptable. Now, this is a reality that we have to really consider before God. Let us not, like, let us not be like uh, the oxen and, and, the, and the donkey. We need to consider it before God. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would give us the grace with which to worship you in spirit and in truth. Make the reality of, of your holiness more apparent to us, even as we live from Monday to Saturday. We acknowledge, Lord, that if you are holy, then anything less than holy is unacceptable to you. So we pray, Lord, that even in whatever we offer you, Lord, in the lives that we live, in the things that we bring to church, in the ways, Lord, that we serve others, we pray that you would give us the grace with which to be holy and that all of these, Lord, might be acceptable to you. We pray, Lord, for the way you would have us understand that all of this, Lord, needs to happen by the Spirit. We pray even, Lord, for the way that you cause us to see your holiness, that we might be spared um, from living double lives. We ask even, Lord, that as we move move forward from from this Lord we that you will cause us Lord to be a, a people that are true to you holy and acceptable as we lift up worship Lord that will please you in Jesus name we pray amen amen Sweet message the whole time you were teaching, brother. I was just thinking of James. Anybody else? Perfect counterbalance between Old Testament and New, our brother James. If you haven't read James, that's your homework for tonight. Great countertext to Isaiah chapter 1. James who said and made it so clear that faith without works is what? Dead. And there are some who think and there are some who teach today. You know, Jesus has paid it all and that's true, right? But that's <laughs> all that's for us in our relationship with the Lord. We start there and stay there. But thank God that we grow up in the Lord and, and our faith bears the fruit of works and, and the Holy Spirit's a part of our life. And Galatians 5 talks about what that looks like. It was James who kind of just married what's applicable from the law and from the Old Testament to the New Testament, New Covenant Christian, right? He brought in so much Old Testament text. And he said things uh, like this, pure and undefiled religion is this, that you visit orphans and widows in their trouble. That's Christianity. Amen? Many other things James said. And they're important verses for us to consider and live by today to compare our life um, with what the Word of God says. And to that extent, we can be confident and comfortable and certainly enter into a, a sincere time of sweet worship. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Wonderful to be with you tonight. If you'd like any prayer, come on up. We'll be up front for you. Enjoy your week. God bless. <laughs>